All right, so like I said, uh, this is lecture four. And in this lecture, we're going to look at information system organization and strategy. And I want this particular lecture to be more interactive. Okay, so let me let me quickly move on to the next slide. So this is the, the uh, today's objectives. First, you identify and describe important features of organization. So meaning that we should know what is organization, what is it at all? Yeah? And what are some of the features or characteristics of organization? So we're going to look at that. And like I said, uh, understanding or knowing organization uh, does not necessarily mean that you have you should have background information systems. Then we will now see how information systems can actually uh, help the organization to achieve this goal. Then there is this strategy, you know, even though you have the organization here, uh, you have information systems here. Uh, adapting or using information systems in organization also require that you have to strategize. You don't just get up and go for any IS, you just see that information system too, or there's a tool that can be used to do this. So your organization or you advise organization to go for the same tool. No, you need to also strategize. You have to make sure that whatever you are going for uh, can fit into your organization and can be used to achieve a reasonable purpose within the firm. So we will look at uh, what actually pushed many organizations to strategize in terms of uh, staying competitively within a business ecosystem. So there is this model we call Porter's Competitive Force model. We shall look at that. And also, when we talk about value chain and value web, what does it mean? So nowadays, many organizations are actually uh, encouraging value chain processes, and others are also promoting value web in order to uh, value web in order to achieve you know, a common goal. Then uh, we also look at you know how information systems help businesses use synergies, you know core compet competencies, and also network based strategies some those synergies with other companies. And then some companies also try to be very, uh, to develop a competency area within the, the, the ecosystem. They are all strategic way of staying uh, surviving. Then we look at the network-based strategies, achieving a competitive advantage. Then we assess the challenges posed by strategic information systems and also uh, management solutions. What management solutions? Hello. So let's continue. Okay, so uh, not this, uh, this is uh, all right. And then, so let, let's move on to our next analysis. So now, my, no, sorry, this is not the lecture slides, uh, a minute. Uh, please give me just one minute to get that. I've actually upgraded the lecture slide. So, all right. So, please, uh, now my question is what is organization? So, this is a question to the class. Please, when they say organization, what does it mean? So, uh, it's open to the class. I told you that. Yes, Williams, Johannes, up, Williams. Uh, William. William, please, uh, you are muted. Kindly unmute yourself. What's the organization? Yes, organization is a social technical system where people work in a coherent manner in order to achieve. Uh, uh, William, can you can you uh, start again? You say it's what? It's a social technical system. You, you mean where social people... social technical this way? Yes. Okay. No. Yeah. Uh, that's a ridiculous system where people work in a coherent manner in order to achieve uh, an organizational objective. Very good. Okay, very good. Uh, Bernard. Bernard. Wait, uh, okay, so organi an organization is a managed system that is designed and operated to achieve a specific goals and objectives. Okay. So I see that you are saying that it's a system. If it's organization is a system, what does it mean? What does it mean to say that organization 
the system. Gideon. That, that um, for my understanding for the system is that it involves um, an entity that has procedures, um, processes at achieving a goal. Very good. Yes, you're right. Good. So it's like more or less uh, different, uh, you have different components and different you know, aspects in terms of the standard, uh, standard of operating procedure and others that come together to achieve a common goal. That's fine. Uh, William, your hand is still up. Do you want to see something? More? Yes, sir. Yes. It, it simply means that all the units in the organization do not work as, as uh, they work together in a coherent manner. So it means if there's finance, finance has to interface with the uh, account, account is marketing and so on and so forth. Okay. So they work so can in, we, a, in a way that they all communicate. Very good, William. Can we say that University of Ghana is an organization? Can we say that University of Ghana is an organization? Anyone and why? Can we also say that Eco Bank is an organization and why? Benjamin. Um, University of Ghana is uh, an organization because there are formalized uh, reporting structures and then okay. units with uh, operating procedures. Very good. Okay, all right, that's good. Uh, Linda. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. And Ecobank as well is an organization because they also have system procedures and structures in place to provide services. So in this case, can we say that, you know, when we started this lecture, mostly a huge organization throughout. In most cases, a huge organization actually. Now, so can we say that using organization here uh, cut across uh, different disciplines and different sectors, including banks, uh, educational institutions, and then even SMEs and all that. Can we say that? Uh, Godfrey, not a... Yes, sir, yes. We, can say we can say that, sir. All right. Uh, Comfort, do you, uh, Comfort, do you want to say something? Yes, sir. I wanted to say that it's probably Yes, because um, they are all geared towards accomplishing a particular goal. So that makes them an organization. All right, good. Very good. So now, now let's look at uh, a more formalized definition to organization. What you guys have actually given is it's not wrong. You're right. But you know, uh, organization, the word organization can be looked at in two different uh, eyes or lens. So we have, you know, you can look at this as a technical, in a technical way and also look at it in a behavioral way. If I ask someone who is a computer scientist or let's say someone who has done mathematics to tell or a data scientist to find an organization, uh, he will be tempted to go towards this definition. Whereas if I ask someone who has done archeology span or let's say psychology, they also give Definition. So, definition to organization is actually not cast in stone. It depends on the discipline and the angle that you are coming from. Now, if you look at these two definitions, with a technical one, it says that it's a formal structure. It's a formal structure. And then the aspect where I somehow, you know, had a little problem with the first definition, where it says it's a socio technical. Yes, organization can be socio technical, but it's not all organization that is socio technical. I don't know whether, you know, it, because in, in IS, okay, maybe it depends on how you define social technical. In IS, the technical part is, a, is more or less the computational and anything practical. And then of course you have the social aspect where you have the human, the law and others. Okay, so now, but of course, <laughs> in, in, in other words, your definition can combine, I mean, both of this. Okay, so it's a formal structure that process resources from the environment because organization is mostly situated within a particular space or environment. 
So it's a formal structure. It processes resources that come from the environment. And then, of course, give us a final output. Give us a final output. And then the processing here may not necessarily be using computers or eyes to process. If the human, the, the human, the people working there, the operational workers, uh, the processes, even if you have to do the manual before even computers can, came, uh, there was still some sort of processing of resources or processing. You have people sitting there doing a manual processing. Now, we can also say that it's a, it's a, it's a formal legal entity with internal rules and procedures as well as social structure. So technically, you can look at it that way. And like I said, behaviorally, you may also, if you ask someone, a lawyer or someone with a strong social background, he will tell you that it's more or less a collection of privileges, rights, obligations, responsibilities. That is balanced over a period of time through conflict and then conflict resolution. So you can also look at the definition in the behavioral way. Like I said, depends on the angle you are coming from. And then this is MBA. MBA, our final exams, we don't ask questions like, what is, define this, no. So the idea here is for you to understand and have a feel of, okay. hello, someone is talking, or know what organization is all about. But there's no way I will ask you to tell me what is, organized, what is an organization and give me the difference between the technical and the behavioral definitions to organization. Now let's look at, in the technical perspective, uh, I said it's more or less an input coming from the environment. So the environment here, you have customers, you have uh, regulatory institutions, you have suppliers. So all these gives an input into the environment, into the organization. So the organization goes through uh, a process or a way to process the input or the resources from the environment and give out the output. And of course, this output could be also given to customers and then feedback from customers, feedback from the environment is also sent, can also be sent into the same organization for processing and it goes on and on and on. Now, behaviorally, uh, we said we are, where it's a formal structure. So the structure of hierarchy, organization is made up of hierarchy. If you look at the technical one, it didn't go into details, you know, the hierarchical structure of the organization, but with the behavioral aspect, it takes a critical look at the hierarchy, the organizational chart, the layers in the organization, how are labor or sorry, a work divided among the labor and people within the setup? What are the rules, the laws, the policies, the procedures that you, you abide in order to achieve a common goal? Then of course, the processes and also the culture of the organization behaviorally, those things are highly considered. Then uh, you have the processes, rights and obligations, privileges, responsibilities, values, norms, and the people. So here, if you look at this definition, uh, the same resources coming from the environment and all these, the structure, the processes are put in place in order to give us an output and back into the environment. So if you look at the two definitions, one of them actually look at it from outside, from our scale in a way that you have the, the inputs into the organization. So whatever goes in there, we use the word processing. It's been processed and of course you have the output. So in this case, we can now conclude by saying that of course, University of Ghana is an organization. It's also a formal structure, just as resources and input comes in, we process it and then give out the final output into the environment. We get students from the environment coming in. We take them through kind of academic exercises. At the end of the day, we change, we change them out into the environment. And of course, they go out there and then also give out the output and then probably solve the, uh, the, the societal or the environmental challenges. Now, but within, there are rules, there are hierarchies, there are division of labor, you know, culture and all that. Like I said, so now let's look at some of the characteristics of organization. So I still open this one to the floor. So based on these uh, behavioral and technical definitions to organization, what are some of the characteristics of organization? Okay, in the, oh yes, okay, glad, uh, Linda. 
Um, organizations are goal-oriented. They have a specific mm -hmm. objective. Okay. Very good. Goal-oriented. Good. Uh, yes. Any, uh, Alex? Yeah. yeah. Organization also has, has procedures that they follow. Good. Procedures. So these are, yes. What else? Okay. So let me, let me, uh, of course, I have some of the characteristics, but you know, not all. And let me take uh, Kevin. Kelvin. Hello, good morning. Please, good organizations morning, also have uh, their own structures, whether informal structures. or formal. Very good. So structures. Yes. Any? Uh, let me take uh, Bernard. Doctor, so an organization is a social entity. That means it consists of people, group of people. Very good. You're right. Uh, so um, I think uh, today I like William. William is contributing a lot in class. That's excellent. So let me take Matilda. Matilda. Yes, there is also division of labor. We have different units or departments that work together. Very good. Division of labor. Very good. Uh, let me take Nelson. Uh, please, organization have a common goal an objective or vision okay. and mission. Very good. So uh, there's a strategic plan in place. Okay. Romeo. An, an organization needs to be flexible. Flexible. Okay. Mm. All right. So uh, I will take uh, Baba Jama. Organization has a identity. Say it again. Uh, Jama, I think your network is, is a bit problematic. You may want to consider changing your position. Otherwise, okay, so anyway, thank you very much for these uh, contributions. Now, let me take this so that uh, I'll still open up the floor. Like I said, I want this class to be very interactive. So now these are some of the features that I have here. There are others along the line. I will also uh, bring them. Okay, yes, legal entity. Okay, now I get it now. I think you, you, you typed it there in the chat box. Now, uh, so these are the features I have, and I want to open it up. And then, uh, uh, so the class, you may want to, you pick one, and then uh, we pick the one after the other. So I want you to do the discussion and then explain. Let's look at the uh, hierarchical structure. Somebody actually made mention of the structure. So uh, can someone throw more lights on hierarchical structure? And someone threw more light on her. Ben, 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 Benjamin Okuni. So oh, we are looking say, if you say, yes. Yes, if you say hierarchical structure, that means there is a formal reporting order to take up instructions and also to deliver results or expectations to. Very good. So uh, something like this. Right? So so this is more or less hierarchical. You know, I can go on and on and on. So there are all different offices, different departments, different uh, units. You know, so meaning that when it, when it has a when there is a structure, for instance, if you are at this level, you have someone you report to. This person also report to this person. So meaning that if there's a problem, if there's a problem, uh, you cannot bypass the person you report to, and go and, and go and report it to this person, unless of course. Uh, there are some exceptions where you can bypass your immediate boss. Uh, and that one is even legally binded that if you, if you complain or say something, or there's a problem you want your immediate boss to solve, and the immediate boss, because of conflict of interest, and he's not solving it, uh, there's some kind of a legal way that you can report to someone uh, who can also take the matter on and all that. Otherwise, formally, you have to report to your immediate boss and all that. So this makes it a, a structure. So this is a structure, this is a layer. And then uh, of course, you know, with this uh, layer, uh, when you move this way, of course, this is what we call hierarchical. Hierarchical is an indication that, you know, you have a parent and a child. This, this is a parent, this is a child, a parent and a child and all that. Okay, so I'll take the next, uh, uh, which is accountability. Authority and system of impartial decision making. Can someone also take this point and explain as a feature of an organization? Uh, Gideon, your hand is up. Do you want to respond to the second one? 
No, I wanted to respond to the first one, but okay, in, you know, um, you may want briefly. to do more like so. Hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. okay. So, um, in our organizational behavior and management, we went to the hierarchy, either flat or tall. So yes. that um, hierarchical structure, I mean, yeah, very need to this next chapter right, to come in. We will look at flat and tall. Uh, okay. Why information system can be used to achieve the flat. Anyway, we'll talk about it today. Yes, so go on. Hello? No, say I'm, I'm, I'm done. Okay. No, I'm okay. done. All right. Uh, so let me take uh, Linda. Anyone to respond to accountability, authority in the system of impartial decision? Yes. I, I, I thought that this class should be you know, interactive because Many of you, if not all of, if not uh, many of, if not all, are actually working. So I expect that you know you tell us more about the uh, what is actually going on. Tell me more about the practical situation there. So uh, Linda, go ahead. So on the accountability and authority in system, building on the hierarchical system, you realize that you report to somebody, so you are held accountable for every action that you take and every decision that is made. It is also being accounted for or also being audited in the sense that you do not make decisions that only favor you, but will favor the entire organization. All right, very good. So what about the, uh, so you have already explained authority in the system of impartial decision. Okay, good. Any other one to, to add more? Uh, Patrick, do you want to add more? Um, so I would just want to just chip in a little. So within the organizational setting, people are entrusted with resources, responsibilities, and then as a result of that, they also get to enjoy certain rights. So as part of the organizational setup, they are required to be accountable for the responsibilities that they are assigned to by going according to the hierarchical structure as we touched on. And in the expression of their authorities, given unto them to, there is that expectation on them to be impartial in very their decision making, yeah. Very good, 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 good. All right, so I think that, you know, we have had enough of this explanation. So let's take the second, the third point. Adherence to principle Look, of Look, I want to add. Uh, okay, go ahead, please, Gideon. Gideon. Okay, all right, Doc. Uh, so Doc, in, in, in terms of, yes, Doc. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, Doc, in terms of the authority, there is always a maker and checker. So within the organization, someone um, um, for, for, for accountability um, purposes, there's always someone that um, initiates a transaction, initiates a, a work system, initiates something. And there's always someone above that person who checks. And this is um, in itself a, a formal way of uh, accountability and also impartial okay. decisions. Very good, good. So now let's take uh, the, the adherence to principles of efficiency. So uh, anyone to respond to this? You know, when they talk about efficiency, it comes with also time. So uh, Patrick. So Doc, I will have put you from this. You know, one of the features of organizations is that they, are, they have resources, which in itself yes. is um, limited, limited in a way. Yes. And so what the organization seeks to do is to make the utmost use of those resources in order to optimize the objectives that they have. Okay. Very good. Okay, so now any other? So the resources are limited. Okay, Nelson. Nelson. No, please, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, in the explanation to the adherence to the principle of efficiency, there's some level of uh, ethical procedures, and then there's some level of punctuality. There's some to ensure that every individual working in the organization uh, Nelson, your network is fine. To, okay. In order to achieve the organizational goals and objective on time as well. Very good. So I'll take Kelvin. 
Kevin. Yes, thank you very much. So with, yes. with adherence to a principle of efficiency, some uh, organizations put uh, rules and regulations in place as to um, time you should report or you can't miss work for some number of days or how to use the resources in order not to waste it and, and be more efficient in our usage. Very good. So in effect, we say that, you know, resources are actually limited. And then uh, as you just pointed out, there are rules, standard operating procedures that you have to adhere to in order to use these limited resources to achieve the goal of the organization, the organizational goal. So that is why usually, I said you sometimes, I keep saying that efficiency also comes to time. Uh, if you delay somehow and also a blow off the resources, uh, you may not be able to achieve the goal that you want to achieve with the limited resources that you have. And this may increase the cost involved in uh, achieving the goal. Okay, so that is why, you know, in this, uh, in this MI, MBA program, you guys are taught management science. So management science is an optimization technique or optimization course, or we, a course that we learn a lot about optimization in order to optimize uh, your processes or you optimize your, your, your techniques to, uh, so, to solve a particular problem. And you are doing linear programming, you know, it's an optimization technique. You are doing assignment, you are doing transportation, you are doing Tableau. You know, there are ways in which the build of uh, capacity to optimize or maybe uh, uh, adhere to certain uh, principles in terms of uh, efficiency. So, and I know that many, many of you, all of you are actually enjoying the, the management science course. Okay. And then I know that, so, I also heard that, yeah, yeah it's so well, 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 No, no quite the mention of management science. <laughs> no, because management science is highly linked to when it comes to adherence to efficiency. Apart from the rules and the laws associated with it, you need to optimize every stage at all. And learning management science will build your capacity to optimize at all stage, stages. If you want to work with uh, 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 Guinness Ghana and you want to supply Guinness to all the 16 regions uh, in Ghana, so as to whether you should go to Upper East region first before you go to Eastern region, then to Ashanti region, you need to do some assignments. You can use Tableau assignment techniques you model it and it will tell you that, you know, we have a minimal, minimal spanning tree. It will tell you, or let's say traveling six month problem. It will tell you where you should go first and where you should. So you see, it's a very good course. And I think that it's a nice course. And many students enjoy that course very much. And I know that you're all enjoying that course. We thank God. Indeed. <laughs> yes. So let's move on. So the next one is routines and business processes. You know, many a times students, uh, they, they, many students don't like it as much, but some people think that uh, the courses that are a bit, you know, that takes much of their time is this MIS and also management science. By the end of the day, they get to enjoy the management science more. So uh, routines and business processes, anyone to touch on this? Linda, today, Linda, today, dear, in fact, congratulations. I'm so excited about your contribution today. Uh, Thank you, Doc. <laughs> yes. So you let me, let me give the, the I think uh, Alice, Alice hand is up. So let me give the opportunity to Alice. Alice has not spoken. Alice. Yeah, thank you, Doc. So for yeah. routines and business processes, normally in organizations, roles of the people are stated explicitly. So you are able to know what you are supposed to do. And since the roles are related. Once people are able to, um, they are able to perform their roles, the business processes is completed. Good, good. Yes, so it means that uh, business processes actually subsumes that of routines or routines are a subset of business processes. So within a single process, you go through different routines in order to achieve that uh, process. And it is a common feature in every organization. Right now, even at the University of Ghana, which I said is also an, organ it's an organization, uh, yes, at the end of the day, we want to churn out students from MIS, like students earning MBA in MIS. So there's a lot of uh, processes within 
we can take one process as teaching or teaching, let's say, management information systems. And in teaching it, I have to go through different routines. As a lecturer, I must prepare, I must learn, I must do this. You know, these are all routines in, in, in order for me to be able to achieve the process of uh, completing the course MIAs. So, and several other processes within the routine, within the, the go, within, let's say, the business. So now let, let's leave that and move on to the next. Organizational politics and culture. And every organization that are politics, of course, even this politics and culture will come again. So you let us not talk about it for now. But every organization has its own culture and politics within. And also another feature is also the, the sorry, the organizational politics, culture, the environment, and the structure. We will, we will talk more about this as we move on. So now let's look at, um, uh, we are still talking about organization. Now, information technology organization influence each other. And then these are the, the relationship that influence, uh, relationship influenced by organizations. In other ways, you will see that this one, if you look at these, the structure of the organization, the business process, the politics, the culture, the environment, and the decision making, they are actually what we call mediating factors between uh, information systems here or information technology here and then the organization. So uh, organization and information system, we are looking at the relationship between the two. But these are mediating factors because if you want to go for any IT infrastructure, or you want to actually do anything in relation to information systems, then you need to consider the structure of the organization, the business process, the politics, the culture, the environment, and also decision, the kind of decisions that you make. Like I said, so these factors, we call them mediating factors. Now, so you have mediating factors, information technology stroke information systems, and also the organization here. So there is a two-way relationship between organizations and the information technology or information system. Now, this is a complex two-way relationship, which is mediated by many factors, and those factors are here. Uh, so we have these factors. Maybe uh, you may want to add uh, other factors as well uh, later. Then, uh, of course, which are, I mean, decision-making and all that. So other factors mediating the relationship also include organizational culture and all that. So now let's discuss them. Uh, when they see a mediating factor in respect of environment, culture, structure, business processes, politics, and all that, what does it mean? So we take them one after the other. First, we take the business process. You guys have already explained the business process. Now, Routines are just standard operating procedure. And I think one of you actually used the word. And then a processes is a collection of routines, meaning that routines are a subset of a business process. And then uh, the firm or the business itself is just a collection of different processes. So we can put it this way, something like this. So in between here, uh, we have some um, routines we have business process, and then we have a, a firm or a business. Meaning that the, the business or a firm is made up of different processes within, and then within each, if you take one a process or, an, or an, a, a process, a process is also made up of different, different routines. So routines are a subset of a business process. And of course, a collection of different processes to give us our firm or a business. Now, uh, you can use this diagram, I mean, in line with that. But information systems application actually require that individual routines and business processes change to achieve high level of organizational performance. Now, what, what, so information systems, how the information system comes in here? Now we know routines, we, are, we know business processes, we know the firm itself. So what is the rule or how do we use uh, information system to achieve performance or uh, efficiency here? So uh, the same way, can, some, can anyone pick it up 
relate processes or routines to information systems based on what we have done in our earlier lectures. Alex. Yes, um, the information system, <clears throat> when applied properly, it will make uh, all those routines and processes uh, very efficient by, okay. for example, automation. Um, and uh, yes, uh, such yeah. um, acts will make the, the, the work of the, the organization very right. efficient. Yes. Good. So uh, you may, of course, you can say that, you can also say that uh, maybe in one process, let's say BP1, in one process, you may have about 10 different uh, routines or steps or activities. Now, you will come, you may, you, you may, of course, you can, you will come to realize that maybe uh, this step and these three steps, once we, we automate it, we automate this process, these steps will be dissolved. So if these steps are dissolved, it means that the organization, uh, we are going to reduce what we call transaction costs and also reduce what we call agency cost. Agency cost is more or less uh, the cost that you spend, the cost incurred in actually supervising the processes here. So let's say this, this stage, you need about this business process one. At this stage, you need about three people working in that stage. And that three, one of them is actually headed. So with IT, you have actually dissolved the work of three people here, maybe two, one. So with these three steps, uh, you have about six people not working. In this case, you are not going to pay them. So meaning that you have reduced what we call agency cost. And also sometimes even the, 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 within a step, you may have to go out and do some kind of transaction, you know, just to help this particular activity. So if you dissolve this one, meaning that that transaction cost is also taken care of. So information system play, play a, a critical role when it comes to uh, business uh, processes. Now let's look at the politics. The next one is the politics. You are looking at the mediating rules. The politics. You see, within every firm, and I know that many of you can attest to this, and then if you want to share, you can share more, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, experiences. I remember last year when I got to this part, many of the, the, the class guys actually shared their, their experiences regarding organizational politics. You know, in every setup, organizational setup, there are a lot of, you know, uh, people with divergent views. Of course, this is a setup. People are recruited from different environments. Another person being recruited from a different environment. Coming in, he has his own values, even though the organization has his own values. And it's also coming in with his own values. Some, for instance, behavior, you know, sometimes behavior is difficult to change within the organizational setup. But you need to uh, make compromises when you're working, compromises and then align yourself with the rules of the organization, the rules and then the laws of the organization. However, still so there are certain behaviors that are difficult to control. And some people tend to exhibit those behaviors even when they are working within the organization. Some people would even use uh, their behavior to maneuver the laws and then the rules within the setup. And then when you have people working in different setups, in different hierarchies, sometimes there is a lot of different views, divergent views that people share. Uh, the manager has some views about certain things uh, maybe within the horizontal frame, you know, the horizontal structure, the marketing manager, the finance manager, and the, the, uh, the, the human resource manager, they are on the horizontal line. And then they have equal responsibility, not equal responsibility, but, you know, they are also the same, uh, uh, they hold the same level of command. So now this person has his own uh, views, this person has his own views, this person has his own views. So usually when you have such divergent views, or viewpoint, it leads to what we call political struggle within the organization. And then it brings about some sort of competitions and the conflicts among yourself. Even within a particular department, you have someone who is a software developer, another, I mean, about three people working in the same unit as software developers. And each developer has his own views on doing things, you know. Sometimes when, when there's this kind of you know, divergent views, it leads to some kind of struggle, political struggle, competitions and conflicts among you guys. And then uh, political resistance also, I mean, 
uh, when there's a political you know kind of resistance greatly hampers organizational change so now if you talk about organizational change and since we are relating this one to is or information systems let's assume that the organization is going for information technology infrastructure now i want to open to the floor i uh, open this uh, question to the floor uh, this organization a, wants to go for information technology information systems uh, infrastructure how do you think this policies within the organization can influence the implementation of this uh, is or it infrastructure so i open this to the floor to the class what do you think that uh, divergent views this political struggle competitions and conflicts within can influence the implementation of maybe state of the art IS or IT infrastructure and in organization. Please, uh, Linda, Melinda will set the ball rolling for us. Okay, Doc. So, um, in two ways, I'm thinking about it. One, in the way that if we have multiple people bidding for the IS opportunity, now we can have different people also having their, like you said, we have people from different backgrounds, people in the authority brought them in. In that same way, they would push for whichever IS system that they would go for. Here in comes the politics where one person is pushing for this particular one, not necessarily because it would help the organization, but because he knows the person or he would get something out of it. And then also in the sense that they would also think of what they would lose when they implement this IS infrastructure. Probably the manual process was also given. No, at, uh, Linda, that part to come, that's the culture. So okay. let's look at the, the politics aspect. But of course, the, the point you have raised is valid. It's, it's valid and reasonable. Uh, so you let me pick uh, Nelson. Nelson. No, please. Can you hear me? Uh, Nelson, somehow, but uh, I think your network is still a bit uh, shaky. Please, can you hear me? Uh, Nelson, I don't think, no, I cannot hear you well. Unless, of course, others can hear you. But for me, I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, weak. Please. No, Nelson, I cannot please. hear you. Uh, let me take okay, Aisha. Now. No, Nelson, not. It's not okay. Nelson, it's not okay. I know you you want to contribute, but unfortunately, your network is uh, uh, Aisha. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. sir. I, I'd like to give um, an example. Um, I work in a government institution, and yes. we had an issue with the uh, internet system. And um, one particular boss who was supposed to sign the document for either MTN or Vodafone to give us um, access um, was being reluctant. And the issue was he knew somebody somewhere who wasn't in either MTN or Vodafone and he wanted his card. So he delayed the whole process. So for about three months, we didn't have internet at the office and it made working there very difficult. So very this good. is my view with regards to the politics aspect. Very good. So in effect, you realize that if you don't go for the right, you know, some, just ask the first person at the race, he knows someone and he wants to bring the person on board so that the person will do the implementation. For all you know, the competence associated with the, the, the work that the person is going to do is weak. So you end up bringing in a system that may not achieve what you want, what you want to achieve or the system that will be having a lot of technical glitches, which will go a long way to affect the performance of the organization. So, and also sometimes there can even be struggle between the board of directors, and also, sorry, not the board of directors, maybe the board chair, and then other members of the board in terms of procurement of a particular IT infrastructure. So this can bring, you know, because of different views, uh, in effect, it is all about, you know, uh, kickback. And then when you follow, or when you actually uh, go with who you know, sometimes they end up getting a very bogus, bad system that will end up affecting the performance of your firm or your organization. And then this politics is not only within, we also have external influence in the organization, especially within the public sector. So instead of 
the, the board sit down and make a decision and go for a certain infrastructure. Externally, someone somewhere would say that, uh, don't even discuss it. We have someone to do the implementation for you. In actual fact, this is not helping it at all. It's not helping us at all, especially within our context. And it happens all the time. Personally, I've had a bad experience in respect of that. Uh, there was this consultancy for this uh, uh, expression of interest, which was actually advertised. So we applied, my team applied for this same consultancy. And in a particular organization that we are going, we are, we are expected to solve a problem for. Uh, it's a, just a three month uh, consultancy project. So we applied, our proposal was reviewed by a committee, eventually, they selected us to be the best and the callers that we have won the contracts based on the technical soundness of our proposal and also the, the, the human race or the competencies that we bring on board. So we're so excited actually. So waiting that, you know, they told us that they will call us to come and sign a contract that we start executing the project. Two months, we we're not hearing anything. So we decided to go there to find out. And we we're told that someone somewhere at the top to the office that you know the contract should not be given to us. There was somebody who belongs to the party. Some of us, we don't belong to any political party. I'm not NDC, no MPP. I try to be neutral. So someone somewhere feel like uh, we don't hold any party cards and we are not that. So there's someone who holds a party card and the contract should be given to the, the person. And it was given to that person. Lo and behold, this same person happens to be my PhD student the person that the contract was given. So, you know, some of these kind of things is, is a bit, so this is an external kind of uh, influence from the top. I know that there are politicians here, but then anyway, this academic exercise. So we are just discussing academics. So let's put politics at every uh, Gideon, or maybe there is someone who is a politician here and he yes, wants sir. to share and tell us why some of these things are happening. Gideon, are you a politician? Yes, sir. Okay, no, doc. Uh, <laughs> okay. no, not <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So, doc, yeah, doc. I wanted to add that um, the, one of the biggest politics around is that IT is big spenders. So yeah. they, um, for instance, yeah. many departments see IT systems and things that are being brought on board as as very expensive and this okay. time this tends to um in itself delay or to even um block certain um, information system or certain systems being brought on board which can help the organization the another politics is they are like um it things delay so it projects delay but this example that you gave the yes. you guys were competent to go ahead and then yes someone from somewhere with yes. authority has given another chance to another people to do. Now, if yes. these people don't know how to do or yes. as competent as you are, it will go, it will come back and haunt them as IT having, IT projects having to delay, but not necessarily delaying. Okay, so some yes. of these politics, in fact, when you mentioned the features, I wanted to ask a question, is politics actually good in an organization? Because at the end of the day, it's also fight against, what the goal is. Exactly. That is why that's the point. That's why we are having this discussion. Uh, you know, let me let me even go further by adding this. You like I said, the person that the contract was given is someone who is a PhD student at Abi. And this same person came to me asking me questions on how to handle a problem. A, a, a problem. So I was giving, I was actually giving the explanation. I asked him ah, why you, you get some project. And he said, yes, they've gotten a project from you know, so when he mentioned, I didn't say anything. And I know that that's the project we applied for and we didn't get. And they gave it to him. So he came to me now asking me questions on how to handle one or two things. So that is, that is the point. Uh, so um, let me take uh, Benjamin. Ben, your hand has been up for long. So Ben, take it. Um, I, I think sometimes the politicking helps because uh, people may have knowledge of um, other firms or organizations who have a demonstrable capacity to undertake a certain exercise. So yes. maybe their recommendation and uh, file to push for that person can also help. Yeah, so yeah, it's true. I agree with you. You know, uh, even though we are having a, 
a discussion regarding the political influences. But yet, some, yes, of course, sometimes the politics is, is okay. It depends on the situation, but it's just from few, I mean, instances. Yes. You are right. Uh, uh, Gideon, do you want to respond yeah. to what? Yes, you? yes, please. But this example that was given is not political for me. It is actually standard procedure where if you want to go with a certain system, you would allow competition and you would allow for the one that can best solve your issue for you. But the mm. politics is when after the best solution has been selected, there is a back door where someone is sneaked in because what you said is actually standard procedure. You would go for the best that can suit your organization. Yeah, so but I you know, uh, as well. yeah, Gideon, but you know, some it, sometimes it's not necessarily after, but even before the decision is taken. The board, the board, the board, you know, uh, sometimes the, the board has to agree on something based on the majority uh, says that let's go for this, let's go for A or B. But uh, maybe the, the 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 board will agree that let's go for product A, but because the board chair you know takes the final decision, he can decide to override, overrule the what do you call it the decision that the board has taken, and then because he has a, an interest and decide to go for someone that he wants, he may not even bring in at all for discussion. They will just uh, go and then pick someone to actually yeah. So you can actually. I mean, put the two together. It's very hard to separate that uh, uh, procedure from politics. You know, you can, you can also have politics within the standard of uh, operating procedures. Uh, Alex. Okay, so Alex. thank you. So a bit that I want, yeah. Please, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Alex. I can hear you. Uh, so the, the bit that I wanted to add is, there, is that when the standard procedure has been uh, well adhered to. And then somebody up there who has the authority decide to mm -hmm. uh, yes. bring somebody that he knows. That is what makes the politics okay. aspect of it bad. Because if truly, truly our motive or, or our aim is to get, uh, to arrive at a particular goal yes. of achieving um, success or higher productivity, mm -hmm. then personal interest shouldn't come in. Yes. Our focus okay. should be the best out of the lot. Very good. So yes. if You're personal right. interest comes in and backdoor yes. things come in, it makes the politics aspect of it bad. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let's move on to the next. Of course, like I said, there are more things to discuss today. So the next one is culture, which is part of the mediating factors. Now, yes, we are talking about IS or IT, and the information uh, in the uh, business organization, the mediating factors. Now, if you look at culture, of course, when they will ask you to, to define culture, I know that you all give a lot of definitions to culture. But if I remember, uh, you know, uh, let's say within the organizational setup, the common definition you can give to culture is something like, a, 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 you know, a set of assumptions that define a goal, a product, for instance what products the organization should produce, you know, how and where it should produce it, for whom the product should be uh, produced. And sometimes how do you also, what's the norm? What do you do things? How do you handle certain things within the firm or the organization? Even how, how you sit in the organization can be part of the culture. So now so now that we, we actually uh, have a fair idea about culture, now let's see how culture also influence when we talk about information systems or information technology in organizing either you are going for a new system or even a system is already in place now if you look at this image i put here he said i don't know how it started either all i know is that it's part of our corporate culture so meaning that you know there is something this is how they do things sometimes within the setup we develop a norm and then the norm becomes part of the becomes part of the organization. So sometimes, if there is any change or something that is actually coming in to push or to cause change in the norm, then it will bring about what we call resistance. Yet, so now I still open this to the class. Now let's see how culture also influence IT implementation or uh, an IT which is already in existence or I access system within the organization. How is culture uh, influencing that? So this is also open to the floor. 
I should it be only opening and there's some few other people? There are a lot of people in the class. A lot of people, there are a lot in the class. Please, uh, maybe I have to just pick names randomly uh, so that I will know that. <laughs> oh, today I haven't called uh, them. Dela them, please take the floor. Thank you, sir. So um, I want to be a bit practical because I work with a financial <laughs> institution. Exactly uh, what I want. <laughs> exactly so, what I want. So we were a mortgage company, Ghana Home Loans, before we became First National Bank. And in the switch of our systems, um, software from our mortgage software to the banking software, that was a great variation. There was a very great variation. We were used to the system we, were, we had, and the interface was quite simple. We understood it. You click one customer's um, name and then everything you need to know about the customer is in one interface but when we were migrating or we migrated to the banking software you need to get the unique um, code or um, customer id to get the different things you needed if you need to know basic details about the customer you need a different code to go there so at the beginning, we were resistant to change. We we're like, oh, we preferred that one. It was quite simple and quite straightforward. Yeah. That was our culture. That was our way of doing things. So really resisted, but eventually we had to accept and then get to uh, get incorporated into the new culture that we have. FMB is a, yeah. is a yeah. South African bank. So their way of doing things is totally different from what we were used yeah. to. So we had to yeah. learn and then adjust. Yes, thank you. You see, uh, the example you gave, uh, you know, sometimes the resistance to change, you know, for, for in fact, for the, for the example you gave, it's a new, uh, you felt uh, the, the new one that has come is rather going to complicate it. But some people resist, not just because of this reason. They resist because they feel like they are not up to, they are not up to the tax to use the new system. Like they are just, they are just, they, they are actually trying to protect their position. So sometimes fear, and then they think, they feel like if a new system come in place, and now they are, they are used to doing typewriter, so they don't have other competencies in using IT. So you are bringing a new system. So he has to resist because uh, he has to protect his position. It will end up that because he doesn't have the competency to handle the new system. So that person should be dissolved or maybe his contract is going to be terminated, especially when it's in the private sector. As for public sector, people don't care much. Uh, let me, okay, so uh, let me take, um, I, well, these are all still the same hands, but you let me take uh, opening. Opening, your hand was first, uh, uh, opening, then I will take uh, Rita. Okay, so um, we have a um, poor record keeping culture among public and civil servants. So if you want to implement uh, document management and workflow systems whereby they will get to see their typical transactions, they intend to resist or object. Very good. So that's uh, uh, an issue with culture. So now, uh, so let me take, I think, uh, Rita, Rita. Yes, Doc, good morning. Good morning. So, uh, Yes, yeah, so just wanted to add that sometimes it's just the effort to learn new things. Um, so I remember when we were shifting from my old pieces into a MacBook. I, for instance, I was protesting because I wasn't used to it. I'm not an iPhone person. And everybody was calling this silly queen is so difficult to use. But then once we accepted and started using it, you realize the benefits. So sometimes it's just the effort it takes to actually learn the new process. So that's one of the things that sometimes in the IS. Yes, so sometimes what I do say is that, for instance, if you want to go and do something in the first place, and because you are used to doing something a particular way, and now you are going to do a new thing. Of course, naturally, the fear will be there. But, you know, strategically, and as part of this course, I will encourage you that even if the organization is implementing a new system and you see the new system to achieve a certain goal or to improve the performance of your firm, I would advise you, of course, the fear will come, but just accept it and then try to learn on it. You know, I always say that, you know, uh, there are certain courses people fear 
at the university, when you hear someone going to do computer science or computer engineering or any of the engineering courses, they say that ah, this course, you know, it will be difficult and all that. Me, I have a principle that once someone has done the course and completed, someone has done that course, he has completed, he's even working in the same field, I can equally do it. Even though the fear will be there that, okay, because of the mathematical component and blah, 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 so this and that and that. So the same way, since someone has actually done management science, and in many of many of them got A from management science, then I'm also encouraging you that management science is the easiest course that you can do and get to A. So say amen. Or you know, say amen. 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 I see it. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me call Emmanuel. Emmanuel, your hand is up. Emmanuel. Yes, uh, I think people also uh, resist it, so they are not held accountable. So I'll, I'll give a typical example of um, a time where I tried to make use of uh, GRE's digital system when I had to uh, make inquiries yeah. about applying for tax exemptions. And then when I contacted them via WhatsApp, whoever was attending to the WhatsApp responded with um, scanty information on what I needed. And I, I did a follow-up at 2 p.m. only for him or her to respond at 4.45 that um, they are about to close and then I should have sent my message earlier. So I took a snapshot of the timestamp with which I sent the message, which was at uh, 2 p.m. to let him or her know that I sent my message earlier. Probably they missed it. Only for him or her to respond at 4.55 that um, they are sorry, they'll get back to me on Monday because it was a Friday. And so, so people resist some of these things because they don't want to be held accountable. In the accountable. instance where there's... Uh -huh. uh, okay, let me just end here. So Yeah, anyway, thank you very much because we have spoken a lot about it. And even uh, let me give this one example. You know, when I went out for to study for my masters, uh, I was actually the last person to report because my visa delayed. So when I got there, they had already started the program. And then in Europe, you know, bicycle is common as a student to use bicycle. Even my head of the department was using bicycle. The whole rector of the university was using bicycle. So I needed to go and get a bicycle to move from where I live, which is about four kilometers away to the university. So I went to the lab, you know, I was in the school of computing. So I went to the computing lab and I met this guy, this colleague, and I asked him to show me a place where I can get bicycle to buy. This guy, I thought in the Ghanaian way, he was just going to say that, uh, I went to the corner, I went to the corner, no, I left. No, I could see. I thought that's why he was going to give me because that's what I'm used to. And this guy just quickly went in and then I asked for a direction. He opened his laptop, connected to a printer, and printed map map to me. He just gave me a map to locate the place and go and buy the bicycle. So instantly, I took the map. He said it, and he was actually showing me where the place is. I took it, but you see, at that moment, because I'm not used to that. I took the map. I didn't want to show anything that I'm not too good in reading the map. So I just kept the map in my pocket and I went out. Even the map, where to this platform was a problem. So I went out and I decided to be asking around. If I meet this person, how can I get to a place to buy a bicycle and all that? Then I managed to get a place and then got a bicycle. But eventually I realized that that's the culture there. You ask of a direction, they give you map. So I had to just quickly study it and then move on. And now I can equally read the map. You give me the map, I can tell where it is and the move there. So sometimes, you know, the beginning is difficult. Now let's look at the organizational environment. You remember, you know, in our previous, I don't know whether it's lecture one or lecture two, I said, if the organization is situated in environment, for instance, in Accra here, you have University of Ghana situated in Accra and there are people within the setup, you know, we get feedback, input from the organization, process within the university and give it out. Now, so the organization environment is composed of the forces or institutions surrounding the, an organization that affect the performance, operations, and resources. And the institutions include, let's say, the regulatory institutions as well. Then, 
organizations and environments have a reciprocal relationship. And I said, yeah, if we get an input from the environment, the organization process and give out the output to the environment, the feedback comes in and all that. And organizations are open to and dependent on social and also physical environment. Organizations can influence the environment and the environment also shapes the organization. So now there is this term we call um, environmental scanning, which information systems can be used to scan the environment. So for instance, if you want to identify a customer from the environment, a customer from the environment, you can use information systems stroke the internet to scan the environment and identify the right customer. You can use information system to scan the environment to identify the right you know, employee for your business. And then you can also relate the environment to even the people, the, the people within the system. You use the information system to scan, to look for the employee. The information, information system can even tell, or the outcome may be that you don't have the, the competent person to occupy a certain position. For imagine that you want to, uh, set up an IT firm in a village, uh, maybe a village in, of course, there's a village in uh, Ashanti, uh, let's say, let me take a village in Ashanti region because I'm used to Ashanti region more, uh, like uh, Isansi Monteufo, which is a village. Then you want to go and set up a software engineering company there because you are from that community. Now, the question is, are you sure you are going to get competent people from that environment? To work in your firm. So information system is a way that you can use to also assess and scan the environment and look for people like that. So now here, this is your firm. Information system is here, which can be used as a scanner. One, not necessarily scanning for customers and the competitors and all that, but also to get feed and information from these people. From the government, for instance, government has a regulatory institutions. So you have information system in place. You used to archive every information about the government in terms of the, uh, their regulations. You have a competitor. You have a system analyzing competitors' information data. You have a system uh, also uh, using to manage customers and also scanning the environment for more customers. Then you have financial institutions. Your institution, financial institution itself can be a firm, but of course, uh, maybe also in terms of giving loans and other financial aid and all that. And also culture, the environmental culture, that's organization actually fitting the environment, especially the culture, because we are talking about the environment. So for instance, you set up a, a, a firm in let's say Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia, as part of your working schedule, you decided to put Friday as part of it. So you come to realize that depending on your firm, there are certain things people will not assess on Friday. And yourself, you advise yourself not to even operate on Fridays. And also, the same Saudi Arabia, or let's say uh, one of these Arab countries, they go there, you are dealing with less, you are selling food. They decided to include pork in it. So the culture frowns against selling of pork. So uh, these information systems, you can use it. Of course, in the information, you can have internet as part of it. You can use information system to even Google. Google to find out more information about the context for which you want to operate. And then with that internet, you can get more information to advise yourself what to do and what not to do. So the environment uh, is quite important. And we can also look at an aspect where you want to integrate information systems or information technology in your firm. Within the environment, do you think that the kind of system you are going to use it's actually going to serve the purpose within the environment you are going to operate. You are in a setup where even the whole community, the population, you are going to serve the population, uh, the community, and the community is only about, let's say, uh, 200 people within that community. You, is it advisable to go for a high powered computing system? Is it advisable to go for a data warehousing for your system when you can just go for a transactional? Or operational database, which is very small because you don't have so many people within the setup. Is it advisable to go for access, which is also small, given that the population there is very small? 
or you have, I mean, uh, a lot of people within the environment. Yes. Okay. Uh, Samuel, are you saying something? You can just sit here. Look, I'm bringing it right now. Mosquito. Uh, Samuel has, let me mute him. Okay. Yes. So that is the environment. And then uh, please, uh, the, the floor is open. If you want to contribute and add more to the environment, please go ahead. And if you have a question, you can also go ahead in terms of the environment. So information technology play a critical role in helping organizations perceive environmental change and helping the organization to act on the environment. So Gideon, today Gideon is, is Gideon and then, uh, uh, what's the name? They're actually contributing a lot in class. Uh, Gideon, go ahead. Yes, so um, Doc, on the, I want to touch on the culture and then the environment. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, so on the culture for, for change, you know, um, one thing about culture is that it is it is not static; it's dynamic. So yes. once it can change, it means that during uh, introduction of information systems, yes. Um, yes. we should take our time to do the change management well, because if yes. we take our time to inform people on how things, what is coming on board, can help them work yes. efficiently, they would yes. embrace change. Except yeah, right. if their power right. or the authority is going to be moved away from them. So like, for instance, maybe previously, um, without uh, having a managed system, finance does everything purchases. But now once a, a system comes on board for purchasing, a bit of the power that finance has will be taken away from them. So if there is a little bit threat to, let's say, the authority within the organization, even that one, still change management can can bring more light to the reason why we should go in for this. And then with that information that people have, I mean, people would normally embrace something that will make them their work easy. Nowadays, they, most workers are saying that they want to work like a lazy man. Yeah. So if, yeah. if that's the case, then it means change management should be good. Now, yeah. Doc, on the question you asked, should yeah. they go in for a high system? Or, I think based upon the size of the organization, they should go in for one, that first fits their bottom line and then can okay. achieve what they also want to achieve in the end. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, sometimes it actually fits by the cost involved. And then you look at the money or let's say the revenue you are going to generate. You need to be very, very considerate. You need to do a trade-off. Imagine that you are going for a system that, can, that will cost you 2.5 million Ghana cities. And yet within the environment, if the money that you are going to generate it may even take years to be able to recoup. Meanwhile, there could be an, you know, an equal system with you know, cheaper amounts that can serve the same purpose. So it's all bounced back to being strategic. That's why this course is about organization, IS, and also strategy. So you need to be very strategic and go for a system that you think it can fit in, but you know, reasonable, reasonably uh, lower cost. Uh, Benjamin is saying that what of hackers for environment? Uh, hackers for environment. Uh, ben, you may want to probably expand it, or you uh, you ask the question well. But before that, let me take Rita. Yeah, Doc. So um, maybe this is more on the culture side. Uh, but in, so, in as much as we are encouraged to embrace systems, um, I've also experienced situations where if the system is not piloted long enough, it actually makes processes more difficult. Um, it makes yeah. um, maybe getting your records more cumbersome and it might take a very long time um, to actually realize the benefits. So with that, people also tend to build resistance um, if new systems are coming in. Um, so mean, the key point is that whatever system should be piloted long enough in all scenarios. Uh, before right. it is adopted. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so let me let me say this. Uh, Nana, uh, is it Nana, Nana Kwame? Sorry for uh, what has happened to your laptop. I'm here. Uh, I've, I've had a common, uh, I've had this experience before. For my case, it was during the lockdown. And then uh, sometimes I'll work, you know, while sleeping and I'm working. So I'll forget and the laptop will be by myself. So I mistakenly stepped on it and I got the screen cracked. You know, it cost me 4,000 to fix it. Only the screen, MacBook. So I can share your pain and then the, 
Uh, it's not easy. Mad book, everything about it is expensive. But I know you're a big man, so this one will not be any problem for you. Hopefully. Nana, are you there? <laughs> yes, sir, I'm, here. I'm here. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I'm here. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> As for the system, the system is working. I don't think it has affected the, no, the, it's just, the it's just, grid. Yes, just a screen. So you have to change the whole screen and it's, it's quite expensive to, to do that. Okay. All right, so let's move on. So now uh, let's look at the disruptive technologies. When they say disruptive technology, what does it mean? Maybe I'll, I'll ask this one. Uh, disruptive technologies, what does it mean? What is it? Have you heard of that term before? When they say uh, this technology is disruptive, so disruptive technology, what does it mean? It's, it's a very, it's a, it's a term that is mostly used within the IT space. Uh, Johnson. Yes, so when you say disruptive technology, what we basically mean is that it's a new that uh, comes to destroy or um, renders the old or the existing um, technology useless. So an example would be, or I mean, it, it reduces or it reduces its patronage. And an example would be an um, Airbnb, where Airbnb came and um, reduced um, the, number, the amount or the the patronage for hotels and even in guest house. So that's how I understand it. Yeah, but you are right. So uh, sometimes, you know, every organization, tech firms are all innovating. So uh, maybe there is existing uh, technology. Even you can even look at ATM and then uh, mobile money. So mobile money, or let's say uh, mobile. Let me let's use the mobile apps. Mobile apps. Let me use mobile apps. Uh, previously, of course, we can even uh, talk about you know the manual way, but the manual is not a technology. So, previously we were what where when we there was uh, no ATM, we will, we will walk into the bank, you know, join a queue and all that just to cash or do some transaction with the bank. So ATM came to solve some of these problems. Now ATM is a technology, and also mobile app also came. So uh, many people hardly actually go to ATM to just cash or maybe uh, to take money and go and give it to someone. For instance, you want to make some payments. You go to ATM and take the cash and go and make the payment. This time, because of the mobile app, you can actually do direct transfer. So this mobile app here is more or less like a distractive technology to ATM. But it is an existing technology, even though it's still there, that many people are not patronizing the match. Now the mobile app has come and it's highly patronized as compared to the ATM. So in this case, we see that the mobile app here is a distractive technology to ATM. Now, and the destructive technologies, you can't take it away. Uh, in as much as every organization or, or every uh, tech firm is trying to innovate its processes. So technology that brings about sweeping change to businesses, industries, and markets. So you realize that when mobile apps started you know, emerging, many businesses decided to also develop a mobile app and it brought about a whole change within the that the uh, uh, Gideon is saying that. Uh, Gideon is saying that piloting for a long time, in my opinion, brings about delays to a proper good map for that accelerate change. Okay. Uh, whose background is as this noise? Uh, let me mute. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on. So that is about destructive technology. So if there is a new, uh, is your hand up? Uh, Gideon, your hand is up. Go ahead. Gideon. Okay, Gideon, if you are talking, we cannot hear you. Your hand is still up. Is it or is it an old hand? Or well, let, let's move on. So, uh, like I was saying, yes, all, um, Doc, all please. This, yes. Yeah. So, destructive technologies goes with. Um, um, I, I'm trying to relate it. It means it is destructive to legacy systems, legacy like systems system, that you yes. were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe you should explain legacy system to some in this uh, platform. Legacy, when they say legacy system, what are they? Anyway, let's so, move. Um, let me move yeah. in, in, okay. All right. 
So legal system in my is view, an old system. Um, organizations, okay, old system. So you can see that it's an old system. Uh, this is a software you've been using for years. And now a new system which has better, you know, functionalities, better features is coming in. So that new system uh, will come and ship or take away the old one. But in, within the, 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 the business uh, uh, space, not necessarily pushing out a legacy system within one firm, but rather it's something that has been embraced by many and it is taking out existing technologies. Okay, at some point, Personal computers, you know, word processing software, they were all distracted to other technologies. Uh, let, let's, and then there's this term called first movers in terms of technology development. We have those who move first and those who follow. So first movers are the inventors, those who sit down, think critical, and invent something new. For instance, the mobile apps, you know, and all that. They all invention, the new things that come, the new technologies are, you invent them. Then we call them the first movers. And then we have the fast followers. So once it is invented, well, we will all use it. Either we pay fee or sometimes the invention may be free. So if it is free, well, we go and take it and use it free. If it is not, you go and then pay for it and use it. So you are fast <clears throat> follower, follower. So as soon as it is released, and then tested, and then uh, people are actually patronizing it. Fast, you go and then uh, uh, also use the same system. So inventors and those who use the system, we call it first movers and the fast followers. Now there are five key uh, kinds of organizational structure. Organizational structure. We have the entrepreneurial. We have the machine bureaucracy where it takes a longer time. You send something and it takes a, a very long time for you to get a final decision. So the entrepreneurial one, usually the young, small firm, in the fast changing environment, it has a simple structure and it's managed by entrepreneur. You can be the, even the sole owner of the, the, the business and you are about only five or three people working in. So usually uh, it is a startup and then the, the, the bureaucracy is, is just minimal because only three people are working. The, that's the structure. And then you also have a, a machine bureaucracy where you have a very long, tall structure. So when you, when you want a particular problem to be solved, it has to go to the top before uh, a decision is given out. So there's a lot of bureaucracy in it. And then we also have a, divisional, a divisionalized bureaucracy, which is a, a multiple uh, machine bureaucracy, just like the, the, the first one. And then, uh, but uh, in a hierarchical way. So each producing a different product or service, all topped by one central headquarters. So basically with a machine bureaucracy, certain decision can be, can be made at certain point, but with the divisionalized bureaucracy, uh, everything is managed at the headquarters. So if I'm in command and you want to do your passport, I remember those times you have to travel to Accra to come and do your passport. And that's what I did. I had to come to Africa to do passport from Kumasi. And then uh, we also have uh, five basic, of course, we are talking about. We have the professional bureaucracy, uh, which is a knowledge-based organization uh, where goods and services depend on the expertise and knowledge of professionals, just like the lawyers, the structure of a law firm. So usually uh, the decision you go into a law firm, uh, the individuals actually have a common knowledge, you know, tax knowledge. And they, uh, you go there and say you are looking for a company law, lawyer or something, or you are looking for a criminal lawyer or civil lawyer or something like that. Uh, there are people with specific expertise that can attend to you. And also hospitals. So those are professional kind of bureaucratic uh, uh, organizational structure. Then we have uh, the ad advocacy, uh, tax force organization that must respond to rapidly changing environment consists of large groups of specialized organizing to short lived multidisciplinary teams and has weak central management, just like a consulting firm. Like you said, it has a weak central management. Uh, right now, I work for uh, CSG. CSG is a, a corporate support group. Uh, they provide, you know, uh, what do you call it, services and also training to corporate organizations and all, that, all kinds of training. So I'm the IT. 
I'm the head of IT there. Uh, I do all the technical stuff, build the website, do all the content management and all that. And then I am also a consultant, a senior consultant there that I also provide training and then do some other things. So now uh, I can decide to just take the firm, this CSG, and then go for a contract in the name of the CSG. Then that contract is my name, only that I have to give my percentage to CSG. Now, so so th this kind of organization is advocacy. So it, that we don't have, it's not, you know, the, 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 it's not like the first one where even for you to take a decision, everything, even the money, the payment of the money has to go to the, the CEO and then uh, eventually I'll be paid and all that. No, I go and sign the contract, I take the money. Then all I need to do is that I give my percentage, 10% or 30% whatever to the organization. Last year, this particular uh, five council organizational structure, I asked them to go and do research on it and make a presentation on it. Uh, this time, I've just explained it briefly because I have a different tax for you. So now let's look at other organizational features. So we are still continuing with the features of the organization. Uh, I believe that the goals, when we're dealing with this, one of you actually said it's goal oriented. You know, now there is a goal here. But even with the goals, we have different kinds of uh, organization. We have cohesive, utilitarian, and normative, and then others, but mostly classified under these three. So uh, I'm just opening the floor. Please, uh, this type of uh, categorization in terms of formal organizations, uh, you may want to contribute. So the first one is normative. Uh, let's take the, the cohesive first. When they see a cohesive organization, what does it mean? Cohesive. In all the organizations, you can classify them under three. You take the you take the, the university, you take the academic, so the academic institutions, you take the banks, you take the prison services, you take the police, you take the military, they are all organizations. But these organizations can be classified under three main components or three main categories. So the first one is the cohesive, utilitarian, normative. So what is cohesiveness? Can you explain that and give an example of a cohesive organization? Cohesive. And then the organization also is characterized by, okay, Franklin, uh, Franklina. Dr. Franklina, please go ahead. Um, I think for the coercive ones, the members have to be pushed to join such an organization. Very good. Just as the name suggests, yes. Members yes. have to be pushed. To join yes, the so like the rehab organizations. Yes, good. Yes. And then the police, right? Sorry, the, the, the prison service. The prisons, prison yes. The prisons. Yes. And then uh, what else? Uh, so where you members are pushed to join that organization is cohesive. Okay, thank you very much, Franklina. Let me let's take a utilitarian. Utilitarian. Uh, let me see who signed this up. Uh, utilitarian. Anyone? Organizations that are classified under utilitarian. So utilitarian, uh, sometimes, okay, do I have hands up? Okay, yes, uh, Ben, Ben, Ben. Can you hear me, Doc? Yes, go ahead. Okay, an example of um, a utilitarian organization is a school where, um, okay. Yes, where they set up for um, specific purposes. Okay, so people join because they feel like there's some benefits that they can get. I mean, the exactly. banks, the banks, the banks that that work. Sometimes you join because you feel like you know there's some benefits. Uh, at the end of the day, you are going to be paid and all that. Okay, good. And then, uh, so it's more or less, you know. Uh, there is uh, some kind of 
reward, material reward, uh, not necessarily material reward, but uh, even the intrinsic kind of reward or extrinsic reward. So you go to school because you know at the end of the day, you are going to get a certificate that can push you to work. Now let's look at the, 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 the next one, a normative organization, normative. 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 Uh, whose hand is up? Okay, so I see a lot of hands. Uh, bright, bright, normative. Right, normative. Sir, so, uh, joining an yes. organization based on your interest or a shared interest. Okay, so the, the, the word is shared. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, based on the shared interest. Okay, so the word that is shared interest. The organization stands. Very good. Shared interest. So it's not necessarily getting a material reward, just like the utilitarian. But this one, just a shared interest. For instance, these clubs want to join a club uh, within the organization, uh, within the community. You all agree that you want to form a club, and then uh, maybe you know something like a, a training kind of you know group within the uh, the community and all that. So uh, if you look, so if I ask, for instance, university, where would you place an university? Of course, we are going to place an university under what? Utilitarian. And then you have the forces, the, uh, the prison and all that place and the rehab. And they are all placed under the cohesive. And normative clubs, uh, groups, they can also be placed under normative. Uh, so these are different characters. What it means is that, you know, each of these has a goal. So the goal, cohesiveness, and then uh, the goal is being forced to join, you know, and then the idea is for you to be probably uh, rehabilitated. Then here, uh, because of a material reward, that's why you are working in the bank, so that at the end of the day, you pay. Then the normative, you have a shared interest with people and you decided to form the group. Of course, there is some kind of a benefit you also get. So now, uh, organization also has a constituency, constituencies. Then the leadership style, which is also another feature. I think that this one didn't come up. The leadership side is very important. Uh, some people are very collaborative, and some people are very command and control. Then the tax in the organization, what do you do? Then the surrounding environment, which we discussed earlier. The constituencies, uh, of course, you can, uh, there are people, of course, people working within the, the firm, and then you have customers and all that, which you need to report and give them feedback. Now let's look at some impacts. Economic impact of information systems and organization. So IT changes relative cost of capital and the cost of information. The information systems is a factor of production. Yes. So this part, you know, I remember, you know, those times when you're doing this uh, economics, they will tell you about factor of production and it was, I mean, about capital, labor and all that. So nowadays information system has been classified as a information system, information system uh, technology as a factor of production. Now. So IT affect the cost and, and quality of information changes the economies of information. So firms, now let's look at some of the, the benefits. Uh, we are looking at the economic impact. So let's look at one we call transaction cost. Uh, what is transaction cost theory? It's a theory of this one, transaction cost. You know, uh, firms seek to economize on transaction cost. So the cost of participating in the market. Uh, okay, so let's take for instance, um, your firm, uh, probably want to get more information about a particular firm. A particular firm, the activities and everything. Thank or your sure. firm, hello? Sir, so, so a quick one, my hands has been up. I wanted to ask a question. No, but I cannot see you, right. Okay, right, go ahead, right, sorry. 
Right. Under the, under the organization. Another yeah, okay, organization. Go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Can can someone join an organization based on two two reasons? Either the coercive or the is it possible? Or just one reason organizations. Uh, so you know the, the so the whole explanation on that is that we have a number of organizations. And these organizations, that is how we classify them. So uh, you can join an organization based on the cohesiveness. If I say, yeah, what you say, yeah, you'll be forced to join. They will be forced to take you, they will, they will force you to take you, they will force to take you to rehab. And then uh, let's also take, for instance, you have a material interest. And of course, everybody has a material interest. Everybody wants to earn a salary. So with that one, I can tell you that everyone is interested in that kind of organization. So you want to join a bank because you want to make salary at the end of the day. And you can also join another different organization with different interests, shared interests. For even church, yeah, somebody will give an example. Church, because you want to go to heaven. Because you want to go to heaven, so you have that interest, so you go and join church. Every time you go to church. And then whether with this, you go to the bank or you go to your workplace to work because you also want to make uh, some kind of uh, material benefit from there as well. So yes, you can have people, one person can join different uh, organization, uh, different organization, uh, you can join all the three categories of organizations at the same time. Uh, if you go to the, the prisons, for instance, there are people there who have been coerced to be in the prison. And those who have been in prison, uh, you know, it, it is only in Ghana that you know our prison services or our prison is problematic. In Europe and other places, even as a prisoner, there is job for you. You can you can get a job and do it within the prison. You can be given you, you can be given a job, and then within the same prison, you can also go to school. I know people, someone who has even earned a PhD was in prison, the Finnish prisons, and then but then when he was when he was being taken to the prison, he had his master's degree. So he decided to enroll for a PhD program. And uh, you know, those prisons are like uh, as a hotel with few crowd Ghana. So and so you see that such a person, he's within the three organizations at the same time, the three categories. He's in prison, he was coerced to be there because that guy in question, I'm saying that he killed someone and he was serving his ten sentence. And then this same person goes to school to study. And that is uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the, the utilitarian. And then you also have the, the, the normative aspect where he also, sorry, he goes to school and then he also has an aspect where he goes to church. Or there could be a club within the prison. So you can have one person belonging to the three at the same time. Or maybe there is someone here who belongs to the three at the same time and he wants to share, this is what, uh, wants to share more details on that. Equia Jama, Equia, are you there? Okay, so let's move on to uh, transaction cost. So, like I was saying, sometimes to participate in a market, you need to <clears throat> uh, pay a certain amount of money to get. To participate, but with information technology, you don't have to do that. Let me give one typical example. For instance, uh, you may want to uh, find out more information about your competitor. So instead of recruiting someone, recruiting someone, just like I gave an example some time ago that uh, one financial institution contacted us to get some data and analyze the data for them. To get someone, you will have the competence to get someone to go out there, use questionnaires and whatever, to gather certain information, analyze the information and give you the feedback. Uh, you, you will pay the, the cost of these questionnaires and the interview and the quarters and all that. And this same person you have contracted to do the work, you're also going to pay the person. But with information technology, that cost, can either be taken off completely or reduced. That is to say, 
All I need to do is that maybe the information you are looking for is just on the internet. Just Google, just Google. When you Google, you may get all the information or you get the information that you need. And even if you don't get all the information that you need, meaning that those that those information that you, uh, sorry, the information that you need, uh, maybe you may, not, you may not be able to get all, but the parts that you are not able to get, you can get someone and define exactly what you want the person to do, meaning that the scope is reduced and the person can go for that data, go look for that information for you. So with the internet, you can, of course, you pay something small, but it's better to do the Googling in order to get information. So this aspect of transaction cost here, it, the transaction cost is reduced as a result of information technology. So it lowers market transaction cost for firm, making it worthwhile for firms to transact with other firms rather than go number of what employees. Now you look at the next one is also another benefit, how IS also impact organizations, so also uh, agency cost. You know, firms are not just of, of contracts amongst interested parties requiring supervisions. Firm, firms experience agency costs, the cost of managing and supervising or which rise as a result. So for instance, you have uh, uh, about six layers in your organization. Layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, layer six. This organizational chart and have these layers. I can implement, of course, you know, the information system sometimes can even reduce the layers. So this layer, which is too tall, with the implementation information systems, you can reduce it to a flat structure. You can reduce the layers from six to three. And the reason is that maybe this person, for instance, who occupies this layer, his responsibility is to just put a stamp on receipts. And that's all what the person does. So he's more or less like a supervisor and he has people working under him. So he doesn't really do much. All he has to do, some of the decisions, he can even take the system, information system can be designed to help take that decision. And then he or they only bring a manual receipt that you put a stamp on the receipts. So you see that his work within that space is very minimal. So you can only, instead of him being there and putting stamp on the receipts, we can automate the system in such a way that our system automatically insert the stamp and also insert a signature on what he has been doing, meaning that this position will no longer exist. You don't need that position. And this position, this person, uh, the payments, the monthly payment you give it to this person is taken care of by information technology, information system uh, infrastructure. So in effect, agency cost, the cost of supervising is reduced because you have layer two supervising layer one. So the cost of supervising is reduced. And this is what we call agency cost. So this is one typical example. And I know that if I open the floor, you can also give more examples. Now, let, let, me, let me also say this. Uh, please, uh, next week, we are, I don't know whether we are having on-site or online. If it is online, I expect you to write your, your full name. Don't put your ID. You can write your full name and add the ID if you want to. I don't want you to put the IDs because uh, sometimes I pick also names randomly and I don't want to say ID number one zero. So your name and you can add the ID. But if it's in exams, if, in, if it is in exams, of course you write only your, your, your what do you call it? Uh, your ID. Okay. So we move on. Uh, yes, so based on explanation I've given in respect of agency and then transaction costs, can you also give examples and then explain uh, the things that happen to your firm? Uh, you can give a typical example, how you think that IS has been able to reduce uh, transaction costs and agency costs, uh, dissolve certain kind of structures. Uh, some people, some works are actually taking, uh, taking care of uh, as a result of the implementation of IT and all that. Uh, Opni. Okay, so initially, um, agency 
this used to have um, dispatch riders, but now with the invention of emails through IT systems, you don't employ dispatch riders. Okay, good. Good. Any other? Okay, so only open who actually says something. He eh? said something. Let me call. Um. Okay, you let's move on. Okay, so organizational behavior impact. Of course, like uh, I've already explained, IT flattens the organization. So decision making is pushed to lower levels. And then fewer managers are needed because of IT. So IT enables faster decision making and increases span of control. So there are certain things, uh, instead of uh, you do something, you give it to your boss and you expect a decision from the boss. The boss has to take to another person on and on and on before a final decision will be made. Will be made. And then they push it downward and then of course the, the decision can now take effect. But with IT, sometimes just a click of a button. Click on a button, it goes to the next person. Click on a button and that's it. Just easy. You know, there are some people, you even prepare a hard document, go and place them, go and place it on, the, on their desk, and it will take ages for them to even sign and take a decision on that. So sometimes it's just a click of a button. So it has been designed in such a way that the person gets a notification. There is something that he has to take a decision on. Uh, ben. Ben. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, sir. Yes. Like the contribution that I want to make about the introduction of the IT system yes. at my workplace, um, I work with NHI. Uh, with yeah. the introduction of the uh, IT, initially we go to the uh, villages or remote areas. We contact the opinion leaders, and after registering them, we take it to our main offices. Then. We send it to an agency that prints cards for, for, for us. So it takes time before we get. And when we get, we go back to the remote places. We see the opinion leaders. We give the cards to them. Then they distribute. But with the introduction of the IT, we have the setup, everything on the uh, <coughs> box. We have just like the NI. Then when we go to the remote places, we print and then we issue cards to them instantly. So with the introduction of the uh, IT, it has reduced okay. the, the turnaround time. Uh, okay. The but what about, okay. okay, what about, you know, direct costs? For instance, are the costs that you may have incurred if you had, you know, gone by the old, the old system? Yeah, I can it's say different. that the cost, <laughs> with the introduction of the IT, the cost has increased. Other than the manual, ma manual, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. Uh, let me uh, take uh, Rita. No, I think no. Uh, Benjamin, no, is it Benjamin who spoke? Okay, no, Gideon. Gideon, I think Gideon has up yeah, before Rita. Uh, Gideon. Gideon, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Doc, um, I think nowadays what we are all saying is. Palace. Yes, please. Doug, please, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Gideon. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I think now what we are also in is paperless environment. So in terms of the yeah. transactional, a lot of uh, printing cost and stationaries um, have been minimized because of info systems or because of systems that are being used. So now you don't have a lot of printing costs. And then on the turnaround time, the, so one of my colleagues mentioned turnaround time. So yes. the turnaround time is not necessarily saving cost, mm -hmm. though, but it is, okay. it is rather bringing in fast revenue so that if we have to close a deal and be able to get money uh, yes. faster enough, we are able to do that as a result of that. And then, boss, um, um, Doc, one last thing is, doesn't it also bring economic problem like... Um, jobs being redundant or people having a certain thing that they were doing now taken away from them uh so this is another kind of discussion we shall have it i think in one of the lectures so let's move on so whilst information technology is coming in strategically it is also uh creating jobs in a way but you let's have that discussion later 
in one of, I think, I don't know whether it's lecture seven or so. Okay, so let, Rita. Yes, uh, Doc, so I um, just wanted to add that for some applications, they actually help you to monitor your own productivity at work. So for instance, um, apps like uh, Microsoft Teams will help you monitor um, how you are performing in terms of what you set out to do in a day, help you set your planner um, if you are delivering, if you are not delivering. At the end of the week, you can see how much time you are spending on your meetings. And so it helps. All right, thank you very much. So let's move on. So uh, we are we are fatally spoken about you know, resistance to change organization. So there's no need talking about it. So here, I would like to conclude that part by saying that uh, if you are bringing in IS or IT, no, let, not necessarily bring it in, but in your organizational frame, you make sure that you do a reasonable adjustment between people, task, technology, and the structure. So if you are bringing in a new technology, make sure that it is well adjusted and the technology is tailored to solving the task you have at hand then you have to also make sure that you have the competent people and the people to handle the technology. Or if you don't have them, you make sure that you train them to have the knowledge to use the technology. And of course, the same technology is coming in, it also affects somehow the structure of the organization, especially the, the processes that you, uh, your business processes and all that, they also change. So uh, these four are interdependent and they're highly connected to each other. So when you are even bringing a new person, it has a consequence on the technology, the tax and the structure. If you are making modification to the structure, it has a consequence on the people, the technology and the tax. So make sure that all these are actually uh, in sync. There's some kind of synchronization and then they all align with each other. Now let's look at the internet. Specifically this time we are talking about internet and organization. What impact has internet what on us and our, our friends. Uh, there's this question I wanted to ask. Uh, a cashless economy and then a versus cash economy. So I'm going to, I'll give you an assignment on this. The assignment is that you are going to explore. First of all, you tell the cash economy and the cashless economy which one do you think is better? Do you think we should maintain, uh, do you think we should uh, try to promote cash economy or we should uh, promote cashless economy? So whatever you select, give justification and develop strategy on how the Ghanaian economy can promote cashless economy or how Ghanaian economy can pr promote a cash economy. So, uh, and I know that, of course, it's obvious that you know, many of you go for the cash economy. And then your, your discussion, you may have to relate it to, not only within the Ghanaian context, you have to relate it to the outside world. So if you are going for the cashless economy, what implication has it got on the outside world? And if you are going for the cash economy, what implication has it got also on the, the, the local context? So I'll give this one as an assignment to you. Please do it well because it's a potential question I can bring in exams. Okay. All right, so let's look at the internet, the impact of the internet. As for internet, you all know what the internet has actually uh, brought. Even though uh, that's why we say economic impact, you have the negative and the positive impact. So the internet has increased the accessibility, storage and distribution of information and knowledge for organizations. And I know that this is, this is clear. Uh, because of the internet, you can easily access, you know, data and distributed data is there. Now, let's look at some. Um, the internet can greatly lower transaction agency costs. Yes, I think I even gave an example already. So let's look at organizational factors in planning a new system. So now you want to plan a new system. This one, this part, this the, the internet part, if I open the class, I believe that everybody will get something to contribute on. So, and I know that you know, but we have done a lot regarding the impact of the internet. So let's move on because there's a lot to cover. 
So now let's look at if you are planning for a new system in your organization, what are the factors you need to consider? So since we have spoken about the mediating factor, obviously the same mediating factor has to be considered. So in the mediating factors, we had, a, we had the environment, we had a structure, we have the culture and politics. But what we did not, what was not included is the type of organization and also the leadership style. And then uh, the main interest groups affected by the system. So uh, the customers, what's the interest, the interest of the organization and all that. So all these, the attitude of end users, the environment, the tax at hand, the decisions that you're going to be making and the business processes must all be considered when you are actually planning for a new system. So now uh, I believe that all the discussions we've had can easily be connected to this because uh, when we're talking about environment, we spoke about the benefits and of course we can link that uh, to this knowing what information system can do. So since we are bringing a new system and we are considering the environment, of course, you need to consider even where you are situating and then the people you have in and all that. So it's the same and then uh, uh, explain which economy is better, cash and cashless economy, uh, defend your choice and how the Ghanaian economy, okay. Okay, well, this makes it so easy. Johnson, thank you very much for framing it. Uh, well, and then uh, good for the other members. Johnson, are you there? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Hello, Johnson. Uh, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. So we can't hear you. Okay. I like, I like the way you have actually framed the question. Frankly speaking, this question just came into mind. So I'm um, now I'll adapt part of your text and then send it back to you as a question. Thank you. And like I said, uh, you just this is MBA master's degree program. So we don't normally ask questions on what is no 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 no. So sometimes this kind of practical questions. And in my exams, if you try to give a practical examples, in fact, you get all my marks. I like it when you give a practical example. To, I don't like the when you just do you a poor because my questions are mostly practical. Just be practical as possible. Now let's look at the what time are we supposed to end this class? Is it 12? 12 30, right? Class rep, is it 12 30? 12 Okay, 12 20. Okay, so we have now let, let me quickly look at the uh, you know, we are still talking about strategy. So using information system to achieve a competitive advantage. So we are all here, A, company A, company B, company C. So you realize that within uh, this environment, some companies are doing better than the other. Some of them are even leaders within that space. Uh, if you look at the telcos, for instance, you realize that uh, some telcos are actually struggling. Uh, I think is it uh, Globacom or Glu is, is a bit struggling uh, to stay in. So why is it that some of them are doing so well? MTN. So there's a strategy uh, which Porter developed, and we can use that one to actually explore and then uh, look at how information system can also help. You know, in terms of some businesses being strategy uh, competitive, highly competitive within any business ecosystem. So Porter actually came out with five uh, forces. The traditional competitor, the new market entrants, substitute products and services, customers and suppliers. So we can put it this way. So you see, this is the environment. This is our firm. This is a competitor firm. New markets are coming in. Customers, there's an element of substitute of products. How do we stay strong so that people not substitute our products? Then we reduce what we call switching cost. Uh, we increase switching cost. Then we have customers. How do we get best of people to subscribe to our services? And then suppliers. How do we get best suppliers to our firm? So all these are quite strategic in terms of staying competitively. So if you are, if, if you overlook any of this, then it will be very difficult for you to survive. 
and this is the uh, Porter's competitive force model. So um, break down into this. Now, uh, if you remember new entrant, so the new entrant is bringing threats. It's possible he has already scanned through the environment and the new entrant realized that the company A and company B are actually using certain technology that is not state of the art. So because of that, you have decided, a new company has decided to come in and compete because he thinks that he has the best technology and the best human resources to come in. Because before a new company will come into the environment, they need to scan, do some feasibility studies, uh, study the, the existing companies already there before they come in. They don't just come in anyhow. They may be bringing in some disruptive technology. Maybe they are bringing the disruptive technology to come and ship out or ship off the, these existing technologies that the uh, company A and company B are using. So you see the new entrance. So time and cost of entry, specialist knowledge, economies of scale, probably you know, uh, reducing the cost and also producing a lot, uh, cost advantage, technology protection, and then barriers to entry. So this new person, has taken all this into consideration. He's coming into the into the market. If you remember, uh, glue when glue was coming in, I think uh, 2000 and I think 2012, 11, 2012, when glue was coming, I remember vividly because I got a job at glue at the time. Uh, it was the same time that I got admission to go out to study for my master's. So I decided to let go of the job and then I left. Uh, glue. There was a, a lot of noise about glue coming in with fiber optics. By then, the new companies were not using fiber optics. It's a new technology, very fast. So glue, you know, everywhere glue is coming with fiber optics and all that, you know. So it was later, these uh, MTN analysts also decided to move into fiber optics and all that. But when they came, all the strategies, the reasons they came in, uh, well, I wouldn't say that they did not succeed. But somehow, I think that they are struggling to be very competitive within the space. So there are other things. So you, the company already existing, you must try as much as possible to innovate your processes in order to stay in well. The new entrant is coming. Anticipate that the new entrant is coming with full force. And there's a lot of things, especially technology, which is a priority in terms of innovations. And that you must also find a way to explore and see the potential technologies in order to stay stronger within. Then we look at the buyer, you and I, the customer. The customer here is also an issue. Let's say that the telecos are all struggling for 10 million people. And then you may have about six different telecos. All of them are struggling for these numbers, these 10 million people. So if you don't do something right, people will switch. And there's something called switching cost. So uh, switching cost, maybe somebody may want to explain to us uh, switching cost. But before that, let me talk about these features. So the number of customers, the size of different between the competitors, price sensitivity and all that. So people are very much sensitive about the price. Uh, I'm going for a product that I think that the price is cheaper. You know, some of us like cheap things. We don't even look at the quality. And a lot of people do trade off. They look at the price and also the quality and all that. So if you don't actually do things that will meet and make the customer happy, there's likelihood that the customer will switch. And then, uh, so let me call uh, uh, somebody hands us up and then uh, ask that if someone can explain switching costs. What is switching cost? Okay, all right. So you ensure that you have uh, high switching cost so that uh, you don't have people substituting. So the threat of substitution is also another thing. Because if let's say I'm using your mobile app, then I realize that the app, any time at all I'm making a transaction and there's a problem with, with the app, and keep occurring all the time. There's likelihood that I will switch from your product and go to a competitor product. 
So you need to establish what we call customer intimacy. You can use information technology to actually establish a strong connection between you and customer. Open up, use IT, let your customers uh, get to you uh, at all times. When they call, try as much as possible to respond to them at the normal time and find a way to solve their problem so that you don't get them to substitute your products. If uh, MTN network is so bad and it's worrying all the time, I may be tempted to move from MTN to Vodafone because I'm having challenges with MTN. But the issue is that MTN2 has been so strategic in a way that even though their network may be bad to some people, but the numbers still keep increasing because they have increased what we call switching costs. And switching cost is not necessarily a, a material thing like money, but it is also psychological. Uh, Nelson is saying that switching cost is the extra cost incurred when moving from one product to another. Yes, so not necessarily uh, cost us in money, but there are other things. It can be psychological, as I said. Because you realize that some of us, at some point, we even gave MTN a name called More Troubles Network. So sometimes we're having problems with the network and all that. But there's still most of the, the, the what we call it, the largest customers subscribing to their services. Now, let me tell you uh, what is also helping which I can also classify that as a searching cost is, you know, because they captured the market at the early stages, many people have subscribed to MTN. So now, if you want to even shift from MTN to another network, psychologically, you ask yourself, are all my friends are using uh, MTN? So if I use MTN, there are certain services I will not enjoy because MTN2 strategically at their marketing uh, level, they have also, I mean, they've brought some kind of benefits, you know, few free things. And you can only enjoy that free things when you call MTN to MTN. So you begin to think the, the yes, it can be tangible and intangible. You can begin to think of the, the benefits you enjoy or you're enjoying at the MTN. Now that you want to move to Vodafone, you're not sure if Vodafone has those benefits. So these kind of things are quite, it's a switching cost. So it's, it's so difficult for you to make a decision because of that. So, and in order to do this, you can use information technology in a way to reduce transaction cost, reduce agency cost, and translate that cost in a way that customers will benefit and, and then retain them there. So if you reduce, let's say, the organizational charge, the monies you use in paying some people and all that, the transaction costs and all that, you can translate that money into making the customer happy. That is to say that bring in new services, allow the customer to enjoy, meaning that you are imposing some kind of switching costs on the customer. So it can also be time-based, very good. William is saying that it can also be time-based or effort-based. So in a way that you can keep the customer so uh, it's very important, uh, customers must always be happy and then don't treat the customer bad, otherwise they will substitute. And of course, the, and of course, the supplier power. So uh, maybe there is certain things that you need and then uh, within the space, you have only one supplier. So the supplier also has some power because he's the only person supplying. He can decide to increase the price at any time and then that may also affect your products, especially uh, maybe your, if you want to go with this economies of scale. So it is always prudent that you also identify different sources of suppliers. And then uh, you do a trade-off in terms of quality and also price reduction. And the uniqueness of the service, which is the, the quality and then the, your ability to substitute and also cost of changing. So if the supplier the supplier is actually raising the cost and the quality is poor. You should have the ability to change the supplier. And then some supplier can also detect the pace in a way that can affect also your activity. So you might also establish a strong connection and let the supplier know what you want. So these strategies are a way to help with statement. And our information technology is a way that can promote some of these things. So customer loyalty, security, and confidentiality of transaction is very important. Very good. So now I've, I've given this explanation. So the floor is open. Uh, you may also want to contribute any part of what I have already said. 
And I've seen some of you already making your contributions on the chat box, and that's so good. Uh, William, William, take the floor, and then you can also uh, talk. Uh, uh, based on effort can be seen in this way. For example, uh, over money, I want to go and do more money with your house. I know MTN has a lot of points than Vodafone. Definitely, I will go for MTN, although their cost is far more higher than Vodafone. Because it, oh. I will have to struggle more to get a Vodafone checkpoint than to get an MTN checkpoint. Okay. So I, I based on based on the effort I have to do to get to a checkpoint, yes. I would say that okay, based on that, I want to see the MTN instead of Vodafone. Yeah, so that's a valid, a valid point to appreciate. Yeah, that's a valid point. So uh, Nelson. Doug, no, please, can you hear me? I can hear you, Nelson. Go ahead. Yes, please. Now, uh, that's the switching call aspect. I, yes. I I want to pick it from the perspective of social cultural. Uh, factors. Maybe let's assume okay. your village or the area you come from, and maybe you live in a yes. city, you have some relative who live in a village. When you get there, yes. maybe assume you are using MTN, and it's only MTN that works there. Yes. So yes. you, in order to change to any other network, you find it very difficult. So that level of loyalty and that kind yes. of uh, switching costs that you incur. Very good. Yes, you are right. All right, so there's a lot, you know, you can see. Okay, uh, any other, uh, any other, you may want to explain, you know, because this course is about IT and management. You may also want to explain how uh, information technology, information systems, based on what we have done, uh, how it can also make the firm more competitive in terms of threat to uh, entry, the customer, uh, threat to substitution and also the supplier. You can even do with the supplier, you can even have information systems that will facilitate your activities and all that, reduces costs and then make you do things very fast and all that. So any other, uh, Nelson has spoken, your hand is still up. If you want to still add something? Establish that board. Very good. Uh, so now since uh, the answer up, let me uh, pick uh, someone uh, random. Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy, are you there? Dorothy. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. You need to say something, Dorothy. About the switching course. Everything about the uh, Porter's competitive force model. I like to bring this one in exams anyway. I just give a case and ask you to use the force model too. Explain how you know companies yes, can. Pa. Yes. Can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you. So please, I want you to uh, take this one also um, serious and then uh, go and read more about it. Uh, because, like I All said. All right, so I'm talking about the. Yes. Go ahead. So, when you're talking about um, buyer power, right? Yeah, buyer power, for instance, um, if the person is buying in large quantities, then the person is able to influence yes. um, the discounts that you as an entity is giving to them. So it um, actually um, affects the competitive rivalry because if your buyers are buying more, then the pricing usually comes from that end of the value chain. Okay, thank you very much. So, so since you guys are not talking this time, and the only few people are talking, I'm taking you randomly. So I'm going through the list and pick someone uh, who will so contribute. Okay, so I've called a lady. Let me call a guy. Uh, 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 let me call this guy. Uh, someone who has not spoken at all. Cry. Uh, Solomon. Solomon, you are suffering. Solo. Solo, mute yourself. Solomon. Okay, Solomon is not in class. So I'm going to give Solomon zero here in terms of class attendance. If I mention your name and you don't speak, it means you are not in class. You only own the system and then you went to sleep. Hello, sir. Ah, Solomon is there. so eventually uh, Solomon has emerged. That is not Solomon. Samuel. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. 
So please, uh, can you also look at uh, what's the name? Let uh, in terms of the user experience, uh, let's say for um, mobile apps. So yes. I, I don't want to mention any company's name, but uh, let's say you have company A, company B, and the yeah. user experience uh, uh, for company A is so bad. So you decide to just switch to company B, which has a better user experience and uh, like you know, it's 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 more it's more easy and friendly to use as compared to uh, the other one. Yeah, you're you're right, you're right. But yeah, you're right. User experience is is, is very important, especially in IT space. Uh, maybe you know some of the apps is so complicated to use. Uh, you have to go through a whole lot to traverse from one page to another page before you can be able to use the services. And if a system or something is, is quite easy to use, why not? I'll switch to that place and then. Yes, it's also a factor. Uh, let me take uh, Equia, Equia Jema. Yeah, hello, Doc. Yes. Yeah, please, you mentioned my name first. I didn't really have anything to say, that's why I was there, but I think well, I want to chip in with my um, experience. I'm from, I'm with a banking institution and then two years ago, two years back, we had more customers shipping in the bank to cash out remittances and then from West Union and others. But now the customer base has really gone down because there are new way of receiving their cash through wave where uh, senders outside can just send their transactions through mobile money and then they will receive it instant. So they don't need to come to the bank and then go through the troubles of questioning and then cashing out the cash. They just yes. receive it with their mobile money and then yeah. they have it. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's time. I uh, thank you, but uh, today I know uh, a few of you actually contributed well in class and I'll give them all a very good point today. So I'll give them all one point. Uh, for such an immense contribution in class. And I've taken notice of all those who contributed in class today. So you have one point already with you. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can end the class. Then we meet uh, next week for the next class. Thank you.